And um, in the last, well, the last sentence I think I made in class number 17 was, our, our participation with Christ in his death was the putting away of the wrong kind. All right, well, that sounds theological. Folks, you're not going to find another way to put away the old kind, not by being a good Pharisee or a, a good elder son. It's not going to happen. Only through the cross has that happened, and only through an embrace or a participation into that is there a reality of that. You can believe the doctrine of it, but... Um, Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, Christ liveth within me. For him, it was not a doctrine. He wasn't trying to teach doctrine. He was teaching Christ. And he was teaching a participation in Christ, into Christ that would change the very substance of who you are. And that new substance would be the nature of the kind that God was after. <clears throat> so, in other words, instead of taking this generically or theologically, um, we need to personalize this stuff. Personalize it. We need to discover the cross as the Holy Spirit would open to us a reality that would change kind. I mean, you know, I went through a process as I was trying to seek the Lord on this many, many, many years ago, and uh, I would see stuff in the Word because the Holy Spirit is faithful, and He would show me stuff in the Word, and I'd turn right around and do something that was of another kind. And that always just had this effect on me. It made me go, you know what? There has to be a seeing that literally breaks all of that. You know, and, and, and that seeing is when the veil is rent, you know, you do realize that, I mean, at what point was the veil rent? You know, that's, that's 2 Corinthians 3.18. So we go, well, when the veil is rent, I'm waiting for the veil. Folks, the veil was rent at the cross. When you see the cross, the veil is rent. When you see, and see the cross, what? See the reality of the death of your kind and and the coming forth of, a, of another, of a brand new another. Um, let me, uh, I'll read a few scriptures here, but I wanted to see. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> I think I'm going to put these glasses on. What? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse, um, there's a lot here. We'll just do verse 10 or start at verse 10. <clears throat> For we are his workmanship created where? in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should just walk in them. He didn't create these works in us. He created them in Christ. And we're supposed to see the union of being in him, and then all we do is walk in them. We don't create them. He, he, they're, they're, what was the terms I used last week? They are exclusive to him and they flow through his members, us. Wherefore, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, but watch, watch this flow, and it is a discrimination here, a, a differentiation. Uh, Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now, in Christ, not by Christ, in Christ Jesus, you 
who were once afar off are made nigh or made near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace now. What a, what a, what a jump that that is telling you, in our minds at least, because what it's said up to verse 14 where it says he is our peace, it sounds to us like he did a work, but now it's revealing that he is the fullness of that. He is the surety of it. He's the surety of peace. Peace. Settled. Everything's set. I mean, you know, I go peace and we go, well, I need that for my soul. I'm talking about everything's settled between you and God. Boy, you got to watch out what you say. <laughs> because we just go, boy, I need peace. <laughs> You need peace with God, you know. You're still wrestling trying to get it together with God. Lord, help us. All right. For he is our peace who hath made both one. Get it? Okay. What he said up to this point is, you were Gentiles. We were the circumcision. You were the bad guys. We were the good guys. But through his death, what he's done is he's made both one and took us to the cross, or, or took us to the cross, and out of that made peace because of oneness with him. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, to make in himself of two one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace. How many times has it used peace so far? A lot. That's good. I like that. A lot. <clears throat> Why do we continue to struggle to please God or, or that we're not pleasing God or that we're failing or that we feel, I, you know, I feel like such a failure, you know? I mean, <laughs> feeling like a failure in light of the resurrected Christ is wrong. Amen. Say, but I feel it. <laughs> Anybody ever heard of stop going by your feelings? There you have it. You're so feely about all this stuff. <laughs> all right. And came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to them who were not. Who did he preach this to? People that were close and people that were afar off. But what did he preach to them? You're now one in me. Anybody hear that? You go, well, I wish I was back in the Jewish time and I'd have been a Jew and got to carry the Ark of the Covenant. You're carrying it. He's in you. The real one. That's just a shadow. My God, what is wrong with us? <laughs> you know? We have entered in to the fullness of all of that reality, and we're, and we're almost worse off than them. That doesn't, something doesn't compute. Something is wrong. All right. For through him ye both have access by one spirit unto the Father. There's the Trinity. Through him, by unto, through Jesus, by the Spirit, unto the Father. Verse 19, now therefore, get ready, verse 19, now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners. Having said all of that, you are no more foreigners. Foreigner, a foreign kind. Do you know what a foreigner meant to them back in the Old Testament? It was a, it was a barbaric nation. It was, it was of another kind. It was, you know, do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, you know, we go, well, I guess I'm not Mexican. You know, well, you are. <clears throat> or I guess I'm not, you know, Canadian. I'm, you know, I'm no longer a foreigner. 
No. You have to see that these were barbaric hordes to them and that they were just, you know, nowhere near like what the Lord is like. And that's why it's saying that. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon. Notice that. It says that you're of the household of God. Okay, you got that? You got it? I mean, get hold of that. Now, what are you thinking while you, while you hear that? You know, I keep having to stop and make you think about this. What are you thinking when it says that you're of the household of God? Well, let's see what Paul was thinking. Uh, now of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles, prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. When he says you're of the household of God, he doesn't just mean, you know, you were a foreigner, but now I'm going to treat you like you're not, even though you are. He's saying, you're the, build, you're the temple of God. I dwell in you. You're not a foreigner because I'm not. I'm not. You know, I have to stop and just read sometimes so that some of you who feel like I'm yelling at you can, can take a breath and survive this ordeal. So I'm going to read this little part. It wasn't in those notes, but I'd written this a couple of weeks ago. It's called No More Foreigners. <laughs> I did. That was the title that it was on. <laughs> we are no longer counted as sinners, though we still sin. 1 John 1.8, right? Doesn't it say if you say you don't sin, but it didn't say if you say you're not a sinner. It says if you say you don't sin. The Bible calls you a saint. Okay? So we're no longer counted as sinners, though we sin. I'm, okay, I want you to think about that. Nowhere does it call you a sinner anymore after you're born again. It calls you a saint. But it says if you think you don't sin, then you're a liar and you're deceived. You do sin, you're not a sinner. Okay. But though we still sin, we're no longer sinners saved by grace. We're now considered to be saints, and as such, we are beloved of God. That's Romans 1, 7, and you can look it up. What, was brought, what has brought about this change? We no longer have standing before God based upon our life, our life, whether it's Christian or Jew or sinner or good person or, you know, all the things that we think are the basis, you know, just like that elder son, it has nothing to do with that. It is that you're not a foreigner anymore. You're not a foreigner anymore. We have been placed in union with Christ and now have his standing with God. Ephesians 1 6. We have his standing with God. I mean, come on. Now, let's, let's stop class and religion and everything and just think of that for a minute. If you really walked as if you had Jesus who's standing with God, do you think you'd act the way you do a lot? I'm talking about uh, condemnation and depression and you know what I mean. I mean, if you walked knowing, you know, I'm, my standing with God is based on Christ, and so he's, God's secure, Jesus is secure with this, the Holy Spirit's with, is secure, because so, we have access by one spirit unto, I mean, it's all based on God, <laughs> to God. <laughs> Why would we wrestle? Okay, well, we would wrestle because when the Holy Spirit breaks through your little glass carnal mind and shatters it into a million pieces with the fullness of Christ that filleth all and then all, 
not some teaching or that was really a good class, Randy. You know. <laughs> then you'll know it. And if that's if that's all it takes, then you just got one thing to do. Just get after the Lord with all your heart. Just don't let anything get in your way. Just keep pressing in. Keep pressing in. All right. Um, the reality of this union secures genuine change by oneness. That ultimately. Ultimately. We become after his kind. But this does not mean that we're simply changed from one species of being to another, which I've used that before. It doesn't mean we're just changed from one species of being to, to another. It means that union has made Jesus the substance of who we are before the Father. You know, when my mom was on her dying bed, she was already in a coma and she was going to pass away in just a few minutes. She was breathing heavy because she was, I could tell that she was not secure at that moment. So I just began to share with her. I said, Mom, when you stand before the Lord and God asks you, why should you enter into my glory? Just point to Jesus and say, ask him. <laughs> Because he'll, he's a, he, he's a mediator and intercessor. He'll take care of it. You know, he's your attorney. You know. <clears throat> All right. So, um, I'll read that again. It means that union has made Jesus the substance of who we are. In other words, it's not just a species change. Thank God it, there is a change of kind, but guess what? Remember we talked about this in one of our recent classes, that it's, you know, in Adam, everybody has the traits of Adam. But in Christ, it's Christ. It, it you know, what did it say? Uh, that which is, what's, no, it's, yeah, thank you. Uh, the first man is of the earth, earthy, and that's, all of us in that fallen state, the second man is the Lord from heaven. This new man is Christ and is Christ in you. And the way to make this not theological but practical is like Paul. You know what? I'm crucified with Christ. It, that didn't just bop him on the head. Don't you think he went out in that wilderness and was seeking the Lord with all his heart? He, that's what he wanted to know. Why didn't, you know, can you hear one of the other Pharisees? Why didn't I get it? You know, like, you know, well, I went down at every altar and they laid hands on me and prophesied I would. Uh, it's going to take a little seeking. Seeking you shall find, it says. <clears throat> All right. We are no more foreigners in Constitution. Ephesians described us as Ephesians described us as foreigners based on selfish motives. And, you know, uh, some, we read some of those things in those scriptures right there. Foreigners are selfish. You know, I, this happened to me probably in my second month in Bible school. I said, Lord, I don't want to be selfish, but I'm seeking you. <laughs> I'm seeking you for me. I want you. And, you know, so, you know, I, I, I know there's a bunch of selfishness in my seeking of you because I'm wanting you for me. And you know what he said to me? <laughs> he said, oh, don't worry about it. Once you see me, it'll take care of all that. <laughs> That's what he said. And that was, that was great. That was great for me. That was great for me. <clears throat> All right, so um, Ephesians described foreigners as, be, uh, as based on selfish motive. This is what is so foreign about us to God. It has nothing to do with race but kind. For this is the testimony that God hath given to us, eternal life, and this, is, and this life is in his Son. God commended his love to us in that when we were sinners, in that when we were, 
sinners, in that when we were sinners, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved by his life. Not, not that his life comes and saves us. Not that his life comes in us and by Christ living in us saves us from everything. This isn't talking about that. You have to divide those up. There are scriptures that talk about that, but that's not the only thing the Bible talks about. <laughs> you know. This is by being in union with him. You are saved by his life because you are reckoned as one with him. He, what does it say? He who knew no sin was made to be sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That means that righteousness is not just imputed to our account as if you've got a little account and you say, Lord, would you put that on my account so I can be imputed to have some righteousness? And he goes, or, you know, and he says, yeah, I'll, I'll put this in my books. You're good. Go on out. No, it's imparted righteousness. The scriptures talk about both imputed and imparted righteousness. He starts with imputing it to you because you're pretty much a mess when he first gets you. Some of you still are, but anyway. But then he starts working, imparting that which is him in and through us. All right, so um, in these two verses, we have a transformation. The substance of the change is son and his life. Both of those, you know, remember the first one, God commended his love toward us, no, no, it's the first one. For this is the testimony that God had given to us, eternal life, and this eternal life is in his son. The transformation is his son. The transformation is not believing the scripture up to the point where it says his son and then applying it to you. It's applied to his son and that's why he put those words there in his son. And having been justified that's good that's great you know that's like the the, the two boys there in, in Luke 15 being in the family but they were not in the image of the father they were not after his kind but when the prodigal came back in a broken state the father started imparting and not just imputing he started imparting and in that walk with the father of becoming his kind this is not my robe I don't deserve this but this is another kind. This is not my ring. I don't deserve this. This is another kind. It's not, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve these sandals. I don't, do, but he's watching and then he watches and he, he's, he's, he's bearing all of this and then he walks in and the father takes him up and he kills the fatted calf, sacrifice. This is slain for you. Now we're not just going to rejoice that you're, I didn't beat you to death, you know. <laughs> we're going to eat this thing. We're going to get it on the inside of us and you're gonna sit at a table and make merry with me. We're not just gonna go, well, okay, and I'll go to my room now. He said, get in here, I'm calling up the rest of them, we're gonna party. Huh? Yeah, well, and what happened was the son began to, with each step, he began to awaken. This is the way the Father sees me. I need to start acting the way the Father sees me. I need to quit going with all these toxic thoughts. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, did you have a comment? No, go ahead. Yes, that communion around that table making merry is is a communion of kind, Christ crucified, and and putting that on, on the inside of you. You know, communion isn't just going, hey, I believe what you believe, and we're all saved. And praise God, He died for us. You know, He makes us eat stuff and put His body and His blood, and He says, look. And you know, He didn't just go, you know, while He was alive, go here, here. I'm gonna give. I'm gonna put a little blood in your thing. 
you know, of my blood, now you, you drink this. That would have been wrong. It's not about drinking blood. It's about poured out blood and broken body and eating that selfless, self-giving Christ. Did I see another hand somewhere? Yes, yeah, Scott? Pardon? Yeah, communion's not possible if you're not of the same kind, and it's not. It's not. And that's why we know that the prodigal was no longer a prodigal, was he? He was a son. He, when he started eating that, he saw what this was all about, or at least in type and parable he did. Yes, another... Yes. Right. Say, sacred lamb. Like, which class was that? I said. Yeah, that was feast and offerings. Feast and offerings. Yeah. Well, that's what it is. I mean, you know, we see it as just the the juices of death or something. You know, but but it's a picture of a selfless giving, of pouring it out for others who don't deserve it at all. Well. You can, he can do that on the cross. He can, you understand what I'm saying? He can do it on the cross. And he can go, he can bleed out his hands and he can bleed out of his side and out of his feet. And he can, he can hang there and he can bleed and all that. But folks, that hadn't really done anything except save you, but it hadn't made you his kind until you start having communion. You start, you start, and Jesus said that, accept, accept, accept. You eat my flesh and drink my blood. You have no life in you. What do you mean we don't have any life? We're, we're saved. That's what they say. We're of Abraham. We're God's people. He's going, you don't even understand what kind is about, which they don't. Yes. That's the key. The father says you are my kind. Yep. That's right. That's right. And that, that description you just gave, you know, they have to enter into that. That's what participation is. That's what we're talking about. See, you don't enter into it by embracing the doctrines. See, I mean, we can teach this to them blue in the face. And if, if we just go, I believe that. You, the, even the words enter into it are speaking of participate. Like when they entered into the land, they didn't just go, we ain't touching nothing in here. That became their existence, you know what I mean? They participated in, in that land. Amen. All right. Um, so when the father said of the prodigal, this my son was dead but now is alive, he meant that in the father, this is basically saying what Robert just said, he meant that in the father's heart he was a son, but when he went out, not just away from home, but outside the realm of what the father calls the son. Then he was a corrupt heathen. He was a foreigner. But when he started back. All right. So what does that mean? When you... When you got born again, <clears throat> God placed you in Christ, right? You can go off down to the hog pen and do all sorts of junk, but you're still in Christ. Did you know that? You don't leave. You don't go in and out of Christ every time you do something wrong. You're in Christ. That's settled. But with, the question is, who is that settled with? <laughs> it's settled with God. All right? Okay, when somebody goes outside of that in their ways and things because maybe they're being religious. I mean, you know, we see the prodigal going out here. But didn't the elder son, wasn't he outside of that too? Wasn't he? Yes, he was as far as kind, as far as kind. Remember, that's our subject. We're not covering every aspect of 
theology and doctrine right now. We're covering resurrection, we're covering that in relationship to kind. Okay, so when, when they go out from that, they went out from what the Father calls the Son in their actions, in their ways, in their thought patterns. The Son, Christ. They were outside of that. But when, when this prodigal came back, and what did he say? What did he say? He said, I am going to get up, and I'm, this is paraphrase, I'm, I'm going to get up, and I'm going back to my father's house. Didn't he say that? Didn't we read in Ephesians here that it says you are that house and, you know, you're a habitation of God through the Spirit? Okay, so there was a return in the prodigal. Do you, do you see that? And that the Father viewed that not as a return, but as a resurrection. As a resurrection. That's the way he viewed it. Because you're entering into what's true in resurrection. You're, but you're not just coming back and talking about it. He didn't, you know, the prodigal didn't send a postcard to his dad. Dear dad, send money. Dear dad, send help. Why? Anybody ever wonder why the father never went down to the hog pen and pulled his son out and, you know, hosed him down and brought him back home? Because this is a, this is a deal of participation, of entering into this, of putting it in your mouth and swallowing it. You, uh, you see, I'm trying to use different, of not just believing something. And that son came to himself. What does that mean? What's the only coming to yourself that you can do in, the, in this situation? Back here in sun is everything, all fullness, all bread, everything that, that you need. And it was even more full than what he realized because he didn't learn much as a son when he was here first. He comes back. He's coming back to the kind that the Father wants, and the Father decorates him. He ornaments him with all of the trappings of kind, according to his heart. Here's the ring of authority because you're this kind. Here's the, all of those things. Here, walk in these shoes of kind. You see what I'm saying? Be clothed in this and he ornaments him in that reality. And then the son in that, when he was dead but now is alive, he's in there and he's experiencing something he did not experience before when he was there. What is that? In there, when he was there before, he experienced bread, and he experienced protection, and he experienced guidance, and he experienced help, right? All of this from the Father, right? You know, can you see the Father doing all this stuff? You're in my house, you get, you know, you're getting help, and you're getting all this, and you're getting shelter, and you're getting bread, and you're getting all this stuff, but he goes out. But when he comes back, he didn't have ring, and robe, and shoes, and now he's being entering into it. You see what I mean? He's not just in it, located in it. He's entering into it. He's becoming a part of it. Once that was embraced, there's nothing left to do but eat the fatted calf. Now we're kind. Now we're participating. Yes. Yeah. Arms, and it smells like him, and he brings the food, and he's entering into the relationship. Uh, same thing. And he got the blessing. He got it. That's and right. Even though his voice sounded like Jacob. Right. But it's still something inside of his soul wasn't fully right. Right. Because he got into it. That's there was right. a huge transaction that happened just by that. 
And the wisest words mom could have given him after he put all that on was, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> keep your mouth shut. All right, so one last sentence here. It's another one of those that I thought was pretty nifty. So, <laughs> What makes a son a son is the son. <laughs> what makes a son... Uh, and I put the second son in parenthesis. What makes a son a son is the son, Christ. All right. So if we, if we comprehend that, if we comprehend that, then all we, all we have left to do to find all of this fullness, all we have left to do is when the heart turns to the Lord, all we have left to do is turn our hearts Turn our hearts, and when we do, at a certain juncture, in the fullness of time, God will send forth the spirit of his son. That's not God will make you son. That's the spirit of his son in your heart crying out, but Father, you have stopped trying to relate outside of him and now it's Christ the Son crying to the Father. And, and isn't, that what, isn't that what John said in 1 John 1, 3 or something, you know? Um, I write these things to you that we might have fellowship. And then he says, and truly, let's be true about this, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. We've entered into that through, through son. No wonder we're a mess. Because we keep operating outside of it. And we keep trying to build something with, like the elder son with the father that's going to please him outside of the son. So there's peace. He declares peace. Now seek peace and pursue it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this class and this course that you've given us. We, um, Father, I know that I am so inadequate in the sharing and in the ability to communicate your heart, but I thank you for the Holy Spirit, and I thank you for his love for Jesus and his desire that we realize the cross and the resurrection as incredibly important things to your heart. And we embrace it and we find it as you know it. So, Father, we ask you to continue to move by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Also, let me just say real quick, I've pretty much decided that I'm going to have the operation. I'm going to do it. I think the 11th or 12th, it's not fully set up, but uh, it's going to